Good afternoon, uh, uh, and welcome to another uh, episode of Condo Insider. Uh, I My name is Jane Sugimura, and I'm your host for uh, today's show. <clears throat> Excuse me. And my guest today is my good friend and colleague, uh, Richard Emery. He's a vice president of Associa Hawaii, and he's been a longtime property management uh, manager, you know, in uh, for condominiums uh, in the state of Hawaii. Thank you, Richard, for joining me today. Well, I always enjoy seeing you and talking about our industry. Right. And today, I think, you know, you and I wrote an article. We, we, did, we did a joint article on um, is self-governance under attack. And I think, you know, that's a good topic for us to discuss today in Condo Insider. Well, it's certainly a hot topic uh, today. And what we see in the past legislative session. Um, so I think it's a good topic to, to get people understanding what's really at stake here because some of these initiatives that people will put forth will only harm the industry and increase maintenance fees. Right. And, you know, we keep getting these bills every year and we, it, and this session was no exception. I mean, we got bills on um, proxies and what, what the idea was, I guess, was, they really wanted to take uh, the discretion away from the board, right? And they only wanted the people who attended the annual meetings to be able to vote, vote on issues. And so that would preclude a lot of uh, investor owners and people who couldn't make the annual meeting from participating because uh, they couldn't have the use of proxies. And, um, and, 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 and those proxy bills are just kind of like perennial. But this year, I mean, it just seemed like uh, there were so many of the of the proxy bills. Why don't we talk about first of all for 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 people who who have uh, who, who don't know a whole lot about condominiums? Why don't we talk about what is a condominium? Well, you know, I think that's a good part, place to start because you know when you look at the basics of governance, a condominium is simply an organization that's been created by statute. It really becomes a condominium by statute upon filing the declaration. It's no different than a nonprofit or a for-profit corporation. And it's an organization that by statute, it is created. And within that statute, it preserves and protects members, in the case of condo and owner, their rights and privileges uh, as a part of that organization. I've always argued that to try to change and take away a person's right to be representative by taking away their proxies is unconstitutional because you're now taking away a person's right to be represented in an organization which they own an interest in, in the case of a condominium being an apartment. So a condominium is simply an organization and Robert's Rules establishes uh, the four bases of governance, which is authority, duty, equity, and protection of the minority. But it's just another organization that when you buy into it, You've agreed to obey, abide by, and follow the governance procedures that were defined. Well, why don't you explain to our uh, viewers what what do we mean by self governance? Because I mean the 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 topic of this of this uh, you know show is you know is self governance under attack. Well, when you look at the formation of an organization. In the case of a condo, well, I'll, I'll just focus on condos. You have the declaration and you have the bylaws, which defines, defines governance. In those cases, it's managed by the board of directors, this condominium, with certain obligations requiring owner approval or owner participation. But in general terms, self-governance means the organization itself, not the government, runs this association and makes the decision on behalf of the owners, and they're elected by the owners independently. So uh, you should understand one thing about self-governance. I, I was the CAI legislative uh, liaison for the United States, meaning I work with all the states in my CAI capacity. Every state in America is based on self-governance for condominiums. Every single one. Because if you think about all the condominiums in Hawaii, it would be high-rise, low-rise, agricultural, assisted living, they're all going to have their own unique character, building, ownership, 
And who is better prepared to make the decisions on behalf of that organization than the people who live there or the elected members of the board who own there? And really, the, the whole concept of, of self-governance means that whoever is part of that condominium, they're the ones who, who elect the, the board members. So that's that's what they mean by self-governance. In other words, the, the, the rules and regulations that affect the people who live in that condominium are not dictated by the state of Hawaii or uh, the city and county of Honolulu, uh, except to the uh, point where we're talking about health and safety regulations. But you know the, the the way it's managed is determined by the people who live in that building, right? That's correct. We you know the condominium statute provides a lot of consumer protection. They have to open board meetings. You can remove directors by a vote. There's all sorts of consumer protection built in the statute today. But what happens is the members, the owners, elect their representatives, who have a now a fiduciary duty to do what's right for the association. And they represent the owners that make the business decisions. And those basic decisions on that project are made by that board and not by government. And, you know, there is this small vocal minority, and you're you're aware of, of who they are, who have been, you know, coming to the legislature recently and asking for these laws on uh, proxies, uh, which would limit uh, the participation of certain members of the association. Uh, I mean, why do you think they're doing this? I think they're, well, I don't think they can get elected to their board and they can't make their, well, how they think the industry should be run. They can't affect these changes. I mean, the simplest thing I would say to a person who lived in a condominium, you don't want to have the proxies this way or you don't want to do this that way. Well, go amend your own bylaws and documents, get all your owners to support you. You don't have to go to the legislature to make it one size fits all for everybody. If this is such a good idea, why doesn't the condominium where they live adopt it? You know, so uh, I think they go to the legislature because they can't get any traction with the condominium they live themselves. And, you know, the the, the people, the uh, legislators, uh, you know, uh, who, you know, have to listen to the bills and, you know, make decisions about whether the bills are going to get hearings. You know, over the years, and the condo statute has been in effect since what the 1960s. You know, right. so the, they they've been in effect now for over 60 years. I mean, there's this long tradition of self governance. In other words, the government doesn't get involved, or they shouldn't get involved unless it, it unless it's an issue that affects all condominiums. Uh, and 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 there is a concern where a majority of those you know people who uh, live or own in condominiums are being affected, like leasehold, something like you know. That's where I think you know we we appreciate the you know appreciated the legislature you know getting involved and helping us get rid of the leasehold issue. Well, this ag advocacy advocacy group that is pushing all of this basically has three agendas. One is change voting by eliminating proxies and reducing the quorum. Number two, this is not a private organization. It's a public organization, and they want all the records of the condominium on a public website that anybody can access. And then number three, they don't like the dispute recognition mechanisms that are in the statute today, because right now there's, uh, besides just going and talking to your board, the, the statute provides for two types of mediation and one type of what I call condo arbitration, where it has certain restrictions on it, uh, besides the normal litigation we think of. But this particular group argues that none of this is working, which is is, is just not true. The, the facts and the data don't support what they say. And, you know, um, so how many people, do you know how many people actually live in condominiums when we're talking about the state of Hawaii? And the population is is, is about a million people or more, right? Right around a million people. Well, I understand when you say living in condos, you're going to have tenants and you're going to have investor owners or second homes. But this, as of December 31, 2022, there were 2,053 condominium associations in the state of Hawaii, all islands. In that, it's about 148,000 condominium units. Believe it or not, more than 50% of the condominiums are less than 50 units in the state of Hawaii, very small in stature. So if you've said that the average family is three people times 140,000, 
about 30 to 40 percent of our population live in a condominium or, or, or and to say that you can prove that because like i said you have people who are investor owners or rent them out whatever but um about a, about a third of our population lives in a condominium right and i and i think maybe that's what you know uh kind of drives what the the the, the legislature does and and so you know i think they have, uh, you know, uh, gone out of their way uh, to do like a hands-off un unless, you know, they get enough, you know, people claiming that, you know, there is something that the legislature should address. And, you know, so I, I you know, so, you know, I think that the legislature, at least, you know, our friends in the legislature, we can seem to count on them uh, to honor the fact that, you know, condos, uh, are based on self-governance and that they should respect that w when they re review the bills. And I think most of the legislators are on our side on that issue. I think that's true. But, you know, the, the things they throw out is like the industry, it's, it's bad boards, bad lawyers, bad management companies. Everybody's bad but them. And when they have a dispute, they're getting taken advantage of by the bad boards, the bad lawyers, and the bad management companies. As you know, the uh, Real Estate Commission has to file a report annually with the legislature. If you look at the number of cases per month that are filed for mediation or arbitration under the condo statute, it's about 30 a month. If you think about that, 30 a month is 360 a year under 140,000 units. It's not that many. Mm -hmm. If you look at those numbers, more than half of them are resolved just through this mediation arbitration process. And a half of them, let's say, are not resolved because the owner or the board doesn't want to agree to whatever the issue is. It's interesting. If you were really to look at the Real Estate Commission's quarterly magazine, they list all of the art arbitration and mediation proceedings and what the cause was. And whether it was instrumented by the owner or by the uh, board, if you look at the issues, they're very mundane issues. You know, they're not the kind of issues that this group argues is a big problem for the legislature. You know, these are issues of interpretation of common elements, issues of who has to pay the insurance deductible. The, the issue is this argument, but they argue we need to have an ombudsman, some government official to make the decision. Well, in 2005, we had the condo court, it was called. Oh, yes, we had that condo court. And, and why don't you tell the, 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 the viewers what the condo court was? Well, the condo court, they had an administrative law judge who could hear certain types of cases and make a ruling. And this group, the, the group then, I can't say it's the same group, that was arguing they couldn't get a fair hearing, said the condo court was no good because they weren't getting the rulings they want. You know, and so it, it sunsetted in the sense that I think we as an industry had it extended once to, to give it more chance, but but it's sunsetted. But if you look at the other states in the United States, they say, well, the other states have an ombudsman. Well, they do, but they call it an ombudsman where we have the regulated industry complaint office, which satisfies the same purpose of what other states call an ombudsman. It's not some sweeping condo czar that can make these sweeping rulings to ignore the law, the declaration, and the bylaws. So uh, it's a very misguided, it's almost scare tactics what they're saying because there's no truth to it whatsoever. And, you know, 514B, the condo statute, the condo statute has this provision about documents, right? One, uh, It's 514B 154.5. And that section basically, uh, you know, gathers in, in the information from the entire chapter in one section. And it basically says these are the documents that owners are entitled to get, and they are entitled to get them within 30 days. And so to me, and, and, and the, those are some of the issues that the ombudsman on the mainland are tasked to resolve, right? The, you know, the, the oh, request this, for documents. This, this group would propose that the state set up a public website, meaning it was available to anybody, whether you're an owner of that condo or not. And they propose that, all these documents be mandated by law to be put on this public website and available to anybody. So the minutes, the financial statements, the contracts, of course, I guess 
you don't care if your vendors can see what another vendor is charging you in the contract. But one of the requirements I'll never forget was they wanted 10 years of all the insurance policies put on this public website. Now, if you think the state's going to do this for free, you can bet that's wrong. They're going to somehow charge the owners. But, you know, we did a sort of calculation of, uh, of the 2,000 condos and, and all these things. And you're talking about more than 5 million documents a year that have to be posted to the website. You know, and for what purpose? If you look at the number of complaints filed with RICO of inability to get documents in the calendar year 2022-2023, when it comes to management companies, I only know of two, you know, and those were, well, the owners got the documents, but the management company was fine for not giving it within 30 days. So I think that's an education process because uh, my advice to management companies is make it easy to get documents. But why should we make it a public website? You know, why why should everybody know what the minutes are? Aren't you exposing yourself to potential liability if something gets into a public website that you didn't filter and, and vet to make sure that you're not speaking badly of an owner or it's incorrectly or, or you're, you're reporting a fair debt thing that they're delinquent or made this fee? It makes no sense to create this public website because remember this, a condo is a private organization, which you're a member of, and you're entitled as a member to certain documents. Why would you suggest making a public website and creating all this cost and all this liability? Yeah, I, I agree with you. And, you know, and 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 uh, I think a lot of condominiums have their own website and these documents are made available. I don't know if, if they're available. And, and and you know, I guess, you know, they can, you know, the the owners who are given access because, you know, they are owners. I don't think the renters are given access to these websites. You know, they can download and print them. And, you know, um, I know in, in my building, we have, you know, some issues with owners who want us to deliver the documents to them for free. And I say, no, I mean, that that's a cost. Why should, why should, why should the association assume that cost? If you want the documents, you're entitled to them. And the statute says that you need to pay a reasonable cost. And even if you say, well, why don't you just email it to me? There's a cost involved because a, somebody's got to go and find the document, even if it's on a website, and even if it's electronically filed, somebody's got to go and find it. And then you've got to create the email to send it. And yes, maybe it's nominal. Maybe it's only 30 minutes of somebody's time, but it's still, you know, uh, uh, what do you call it? a service that the uh, the property management company has to do. And if they have to service hundreds of condominium owners in one building and thousands of condominium owners across the state of Hawaii, I mean, that's a lot of time. And so, you know, people well, got to understand that they have to pay for it. There's no free lunch. Well, here. the problem is, is the percentage of owners who request things are, that are trying to weaponize this because they want to sue somebody or they're angry. Mm -hmm. And so what they do is they'll ask for a document and um, we have a right to say, sign an affidavit, you're going to use it for condo purposes. We have a right to charge a fair fee. But as soon as you mention that to them, they get all upset and they say, well, you know, since you're going to be that way about it, I want you to provide me all the general ledgers, all the check registers, all the financial statements, all the minutes for the last 10 years. And I need you to provide those to me in the next 30 days. And the easy answer to that is, well, we'd be happy to provide it to you. However, we have a right to charge. We need you to put a $2,000 deposit with us before we produce these records. Right. More times than not, I get, uh, I'll, I'll give you an example, because uh, I had a, an owner who said, I want you to give me the signature cards for the management company's trust account where all the association's money is kept. And I want to see who's on the signature card. Well, the managing agent's on the signature card. It's an insurance issue and in how you protect the association from, from fraud. It, but we refuse to give them the signature cards because in today's world, you can steal the signatures and do other things with them. The right. same is true with elections and proxies and things like that. But they, they, they weren't happy with that. They fought a RICO complaint saying that we weren't providing the documents. Now, in that case, RICO uh, declined to do anything because the board has the right if the document's not listed in 514B154.5, an owner can request it, but the board doesn't have to 
provide it. They can answer and say, we're not going to provide that. The most common of all is they want bids for a project. I can't tell you how many projects I've had owners call and say, I want the bid so I can call all those contractors and tell them if they bid on it, I'm going to sue them. You know, it's it's not such a clean, everybody's so nice in this industry. You get People get very emotional, some of these owners on these issues. Right. And, you know, the owners are, are, are um, uh, I mean, the documents that um, they're entitled to get are listed in the statute. And something like bid proposals, I mean, they're entitled to the final contract after it's been signed, after it's been vetted and, and, right. and signed. And they are entitled to that contract. But they're not entitled to any preliminary because that those are documents that are considered by the board in making their decision. So they're not entitled to any of that stuff until the decision has actually been made. What's fascinating to me, and we touched on it briefly earlier, is the proxy issue. Yeah. The proxy bill they proposed was that no longer could you use proxies. Uh, you had to be there in person, which right. now takes any of the absentee owners, people who can't be there because they're in the hospital or whatever, and you take away their right to representation. I frankly think it's unconstitutional, but that's just me as a non-lawyer saying that that provision. But they wanted to take away, and then, and then the argument was, well, how are you going to get quorum? And so they said, well, we're going to reduce the quorum to 20%. And so on top of that, if you want to get business done, you only need a majority of the quorum to vote to make it happen. So for 11% of the population, if you didn't, if people didn't know what was going on, you could have all sorts of bad effects happen because of this super low quorum result and trying to take away a person's right under their documents to be represented. Either and by you, know, and you, you mentioned before that, you know, there are probably hundreds of thousands of, of um, condominium owners in the state of Hawaii based on the population. And, um, <clears throat> and so, you know, uh, you know, they, they, they probably, uh, you know, th and this is their biggest investment. So why wouldn't they want to participate? Why would, why, wh you know, what is the purpose in excluding these owners from participating in, uh, in, in making, you know, helping the board make its decisions, especially by, you know, electing board members? Well, if you look at organizational governance, going back to nonprofits and for profits, they all have members. They all have the right to use proxies. It's a very common thing across the United States because their right of representation uh, to uh, do that. And so it's not an unusual thing. What's unusual is if you try to steer the end results by eliminating people's rights, because even in general elections in Hawaii, I want to say it's slightly less than 50% actually vote. There's nothing that says you have to vote or you have to give a proxy to somebody. It's just your right of free choice by being a member owner in that organization. And so to try to steer it to some super minority and now change the world doesn't seem fair to me. Well, you know, it, it seems like, you know, um, uh, we, we may, you know, have to deal with this in the, in the future. So, you know, uh, what are your recommendations, you know, to uh, board members who are facing this in their projects? Well, my recommendation, first of all, is whether you like it or not, and you're on the board, you got to be aware of what's going on in the industry. I think the industry can do a better job notifying boards we need you to testify or speak up because what happens is you get so few people testifying that um, no one ever hears from the other 140,000 people or others, you know. They, they, so I think we got, we got to get a stronger advocacy from the, from the industry to tell boards what's going on and ask for their support and, and testimony. I would certainly tell any owner or any board that you want to treat your uh, – uh, members with equity and fairness. And so uh, try not to have a traffic cop mentality. Try to find resolutions to the problem within your authority, within your governing documents. Treat people with respect. I recognize there's a percentage out there that just have their own agenda and are very hard to work with. But a board has to ignore that and just do their job in a faithful manner and, and try to educate people. But I think board members have to be aware of what's going on because uh, this is not going to go away, you know, and, um, you know, one of the other bills they had was that they wanted mandatory education for board members, you know, and if you didn't get your education, then you couldn't serve on the board. And so uh, 
how's that going to work for a four unit condominium or a 12 unit condominium? You know, it's, it's, the industry is so broad with so many, so many points of, of types that you can't really have this one size fits all. Yeah, well, you know, and 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 that that's the, I guess, you know, that's the uh, the benefit of the you know self governance because that means that people who live in in a certain condominium have the right to provide input, uh, to, you know, into the decision making process that's going to affect uh, their building. Well, I said in the early on when we first started the show. I said, look. If you really believe strongly your governing documents to need to be changed, don't go misrepresent things to the legislature. Go to your own condo and say, I'd like to change our documents to be as follows. And you can be one of your own if your documents are going to be different because that's what self-governance is, is. The members get to choose. The owners get to choose what the rules of the road are. But in this case, uh, they go to the legislature because they don't get support from their own ownership base. And so I think that's that's the challenge is to get the word out. Right. And not to be intimidated by, you know, you know, by their claims that, you know, boards are bad and anybody affected with the boards, including the, the condo board attorneys and the condo board consultants and the management companies. I mean, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's an unfair characterization and it just, you know, it, it breeds, I, I think it, it it breeds discontent in 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 this you know community. Well, it gives me the, the the biggest heartburn about this is that the facts are not the facts. They're exaggerations of issues, exaggerations of complaint. They're not reality. If you just look at the data that's actually published, it doesn't support anything they say. They just want to change the world to their way of thinking, and they're willing to say, do, and anything necessary to try to confuse our legislators. And, and 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 you know, Richard, you you mentioned too that uh, you know, as, as a member of the real estate commission, you've got your staff, you know, uh, maybe asking, making inquiries. And I know the DCCA sent out a letter about insurance uh, to condominium owners. And so I think this is a good thing uh, that the commission is looking into, because you know, it, it, they they need to get this data so that they can give to the legislature. You know, so when the when these uh, request when these requests come in, you know, for uh, changes to the condo law, that they got data that really helps them make their decisions. Well, yeah, I think gathering data would be my thing. As I told the uh, staff, the real estate commission, I said, you just need to focus on gathering more data. You have broad based data, but you need to dig into the weeds a little bit and get more data. Uh, if, if documents are being produced, what documents are they? If someone's made a complaint. And was it found to be a valid complaint or an invalid complaint? All of these types of um, the deeper dive into the data would be helpful. Okay, well, we've kind of run out of time. And and so, you know, I'm sure we could talk about this for, you know, a much longer time. And so uh, we'll have to continue this conversation at a, you know, at a later date. And I thank you for being on the sh show today. Yeah, it's always good to see you and always one to help out. Yeah. And so, you know, I want to thank uh, the uh, viewers for joining us for this episode of Condo Insider. And uh, there will be another episode next week. And so we ask you to uh, tune in and listen and hope you learn something. So uh, thank you for uh, joining us today. Mahalo and aloha. Thank you so much for watching ThinkTech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please click the like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Check out our website, thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.